Hello, and welcome to theCUBE Unstoppable Domain Showcase. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We got a great discussion here called the influencers around what's going on Web3, and also this new sea change, cultural change around this next generation, internet, web, cloud, all happening. Jeremiah Oyang, industry analyst and founding partner of Clado Insights. Jeremiah, great to see you. Thanks for coming on, appreciate it. Uh, Ren Visnard, Vice President of Marketing at Unstoppable Domains, in the middle of all the action. Gentlemen, thanks for coming on, on theCUBE for this showcase. No, my pleasure. Thanks for having us, John. Uh, Jeremy, I want to start with you. You've seen many ways, been following all of your work for over a decade now. Um, you've seen the web 2.0 wave, now the web 3 is here. Um, and it's not, I wouldn't say hyped up, it's really just ramping up and you're seeing real practical examples. Uh, you're in the middle of all the action. What is this web three? Can you frame this for <laughs> us? I mean, you've seen uh, many yeah. waves. What does web three mean? What is it, what is it all about? Well, John, you and I worked in the web two space and essentially that enabled peer to peer media where people could, could upload their thoughts and ideas and videos um, without having to rely on centralized media. Unfortunately, that distributed and decentralized movement actually became centralized on the platforms of the big social networks and big tech companies. And this has caused an uproar because the people who are creating the content did not have control, could not control their identities and could not really monetize or make decisions. So Web3 is, which is a moniker of a lot of different trends, including crypto, blockchain, and sometimes the metaverse, is to undo the controlling that has become centralized. And the power is now shifting back into the hands of the participants again. And in this movement, they want to have more control over their identities, their governance, the content that they're creating, um, how they're actually building it, and then how they're monetizing it. So in many ways, it's, a, it's changing the power and it's a new economic model. So that's Web3 without really even mentioning the technologies. Is that helpful? Yeah, it's, it's great. And Ren, we're talking about uh, on theCUBE many times uh, and one notable stat, I don't think it's been reported, but it's been more kind of a rumor. I hear that 30% of the um, Berkeley computer science students are dropping out and going into crypto or blockchain or um, decentralized startups, which means that there's, there's a big wave coming in of talent. You're seeing startups, you're seeing a lot more formation, you're seeing a lot more, I would say, kind of ramping up of real people, not just you know people with a dream, it's actual builders out here doing stuff. What's your take on the Web3 movement with all this kind of change happening uh, from people and also the new ideas being refactored? I think that the competition for talent is extremely real. And when we start looking at the stats, uh, we see that there is an enormous draft of people that are moving into this space, uh, people that are fascinated by technology and are embracing the ethos of Web3. And at this stage, I think it's not only engineers and developers, but we have moved into a second phase where we see that a lot of supporting functions, you know, marketing being one of them, sales, business development, uh, are being built up quite rapidly. It's not without actually uh, reminding me of the mid 2000s, you know, when I started uh, working with Google, at that point in time, the World Gardens were actually absorbing vast, vast cohorts of young graduates and more experienced professionals that were passionate and moving into uh, the web environment. And I think we are seeing uh, a movement right now, which is not entirely dissimilar, except faster. Yeah, Jer Jeremiah, you've seen the conversations over the, the cloud, I call the cloud kind of revolution. You had mobile in 2007, but then you got Amazon Web Services changed the application space on how people developed in the cloud. And again, that created a lot of value. Now you're seeing the role of data as a huge part of how people are scaling and the decentralized movement. So you got cloud, which is kind of classic today, state of the art, you know, enterprise and or app developers. And you got mm -hmm. this now decentralized wave coming. Okay, you're seeing apps being developed on that, that architecture. Data is central in all this, right? So how do you view this as, as someone who's watching the landscape? You know, these walled gardens are hoarding all the data. I mean, LinkedIn, Facebook, they're not sharing that data with anyone. They're using it for themselves. Mm -hmm. So as this That's right. taking control back comes to the forefront, how do you see this market with the applications and what comes out of that? So the thing that we've seen out of the five things that I mentioned that are decentralizing, <clears throat> are the ones that have been easier to move across have been the ability to monetize and to build but the data aspect has actually stayed pretty much central, frankly. What has decentralized is that the contracts, the block, blockchain uh, ledgers, those have decentralized. But the funny thing is often a big portion of these blockchain networks are on Amazon, 63 to 70%. 
Same thing with Solana. So they're still using the Web 2.0 architectures. However, we're also seeing other forms like uh, IPFS, where the data could be spread across um, a wider range of folks. But right now, we're still dependent on Web, Web 2.0. So the vision and the promise of Web 3.0 when it comes to full decentralization is not here by any means. I'd say we're at a Web 2.25. Pre-Web 3, no, but the action's there. What's do you guys, how do you guys see the um, the dangers? Because there's a lot of negative press, but also there's a lot of positive press. You're seeing you know, a lot of fraud. We've seen a lot of the crypto fraud over the past years. You've seen a lot of now positives. It's almost a self-governance in an environment, the way the culture is, but what are the dangers? How do you guys educate people? What should people pay attention to? What should people look for to understand you know, where to position themselves? Yes, so we've learned a lot from web one, web two, the sharing economy, and we are walking into the web three with eyes wide open. So people have rightfully put forth a number of challenges, the sustainability issues with excess using of computing and mining, the, um, the excessive amount of scams that are happening, in part due to unknown identities. Um, also, the architecture breaks down in some periods and, and there's a lack of regulation. Um, this, this is something different though. In the last um, uh, periods that we've gone through, we didn't really know what was going to happen. And we walked in think, this is going to be great. The sharing economy, the gig economy, the social media, it's going to change the world, hurrah. It's very different now. People are a little bit jaded. So I think that's the big change. And so I think we're going to see that uh, you know, sort out and suss out, just like we've seen with other trends. It's still very much in the early years. Ren, I got to get your take on this whole, uh, should influencers and should people be anonymous or um, should they be doxxed out there? You saw the board ape guys that did that were kind of doxxed a little bit there and that went, went viral. Um, this is an issue, right? Because we, we just had a problem of fake news, uh, fake people, fake information. And now you have a much more you know, secure environment. Im immutability is a wonderful thing. It's, it's a feature, not a bug, right? So how is this all coming down? And you, I know you guys are in the middle of it with uh, NFTs as, as authentication. Take us, what's your take on this? Because this is a big issue. Look, I think first, I am extremely optimistic about technology in general. Uh, so I'm super, super bullish about this. And yet, you know, I think that while crypto has so many upsides, it's important to be super conscious and aware of the downsides that come with it too. You know, if you think about every Fortune 500 company, there is always training required by all employees on internet safety, reporting of potential attacks and so on. In Web3, we don't have that kind of standard reporting mechanisms yet uh, for bad actors in that space. And so when you think about influencers in particular, they do have a responsibility to educate people about uh, the potential, but also the dangers of the technology of Web3, uh, of crypto, basically. Uh, whether you're talking about hacks or online safety, the need for a hardware wallet, impersonators on Discord, um, you know, security uh, storing your, your seed phrase. So every actor, uh, influencer or else has got a role to play. I think that uh, in that context, to your point, it's very hard to tell whether influencers should be uh, anonymous, or pseudonymous, or, or fully doxxed. The decentralized nature uh, of the Web3 will probably lead us to see a combination of those anonymity levels, um, so to speak. Um, and the uh, movements that we've seen around some uh, influencers' identities becoming public are particularly interesting. I think there's probably a convergence of Web2 and Web3 at play here, you know, maybe echoing Jeremiah's on the notion of 2.5 uh, for <laughs> now. I think in Web2, all business founders and employees are known and they're held accountable for their public comments yeah. and their actions. Um, if Web3 enables us to be anonymous, if DAOs have voting control, you know, what happens if people make comments and there is no way to know um, who they are, basically? Uh, what if the DAO doesn't take appropriate action? I think eventually there will be an element of community self-regulation where influencers will be uh, acting in the best interest of their reputation. And I believe that the communities will self-regulate themselves and will create natural boundaries around what can be said or, or not said. I think that's a really good point about um, influencers and reputation because Jeremiah, does it matter that you're anonymous? I have an icon that could be a NFT or a picture, but if I have an ongoing reputation, I have trust, there's trust there. It's not like a, you know, just a bot that was created just to spam someone. It was just, you know what I'm saying? You're getting into this new way 
Uh, You're right. And that that word you said, trust, that's what really this is about. But we've seen that public docs people with their full identities have made mistakes. They have uh, pulled the hood over people's uh, faces and, and really scammed them out of a lot of money. We've seen that. And that doesn't change anything in human behavior. So I think over time that we will see a new form of a reputation system emerge, even for pseudonyms and perhaps for people that are just anonymous that only show their uh, potential uh, wallet address, a series of numbers and, and letters. Um, that form might take a new form of a Web 3.0 FICO score, and you could look at their behaviors. Did they transact? You know, how did they behave? Did, did they were they involved in projects that were uh, not healthy? And, and because all of that information is public on the chain, and you can go back in time and see that we might see a new form of, of, of a scoring emerge. Of course, who controls that scoring? That's a, a whole nother topic on, on control and trust. So right now, John, we do see that there's a number of projects, new NFT projects, where the founders will claim and use this as a point of differentiation that they are fully docs, so you know who they are and their names. Secondly, we're seeing a number of um, uh, products or platforms that require KYC, you know, your customer, so that's self-identification, often with a government ID or credit card, in order to bridge out your, your coins and, and turn that into a fiat. In some cases, that's required in some of these marketplaces. So we're seeing a collision here between uh, full names and pseudonyms and being anonymous. That's awesome. And, and I think this is the new, again, a whole new form of governance. Ren, you mentioned some comments about DAOs. I want to get your thoughts again. You know, Jeremiah, we've become historians over the years. We're getting old, I'm a little bit older than you, but uh, <laughs> we've seen the movie You're young before. Man. You know, I remember breaking in the business when the computer standards bodies were built to be more organic and then they became much more of a kind of an anti-innovation environment where people, the companies would get involved, the standards organization, just to slow things down and muck things up a little bit. Um, so, you know, you look at DAO, it's like, hmm, is a DAO a good thing or a bad thing? The, the answer is from people I talk to is it depends. So I'd love to get your thoughts on getting momentum and becoming de facto with value, a value proposition vis-a-vis -vis just a DAO for the sake of having a DAO. This has been a conversation that's been kind of in the inside the baseball here, inside the ropes of the industry, but there's trade-offs. Can you guys share your thoughts on when to do a DAO and when not to do a DAO and the benefits and trade-offs of that? Sure, maybe I'll start off with a definition and then we'll go to uh, Ren. So a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization, the best way to think about this, it's a digital cooperative. And we've heard of worker cooperatives before. The difference is that they're using blockchain technologies in order to do uh, three things, identity, governance, and rewards and uh, mechanisms. They're relying on web 2.0 tools and technologies like Discord and Telegram and social networks to communicate. And, and, and as a cooperative, they're trying to come up with a common goal. Um, Ren, but what's your take? That's the setup. So, you know, for me, when I started my journey into crypto and Web3, I had no idea about, you know, what DAO actually meant. And uh, an easy way for me to think of it uh, and to grasp the nature of it was about the comparison between a DAO and perhaps a more traditional company structure. Um, you know, in a traditional company structure, you have a hierarchy, the company is led by a CEO and other executives. Uh, the DAO has a flat structure and it's very much led by a group of core contributors. So uh, to Jeremiah's point, you know, you get that notion of a cooperative uh, type of structure. The decision-making is very different. You know, we're talking about a super high level of transparency, proposals getting submitted and, and voting systems using tokens as opposed to you know, management making decisions behind closed doors. Uh, I think that speaks to a totally new form of governance. And I think we have hardly hardly scratched the surface. We have seen recently uh, very interesting moments in Web3 culture. And we have seen how uh, DAOs suddenly have to make certain decisions and, and come to uh, moments of claiming responsibility uh, in order to uh, police behavior uh, of some of the members. I think that's important. I think it's going to redefine how we're thinking about that particularly new governance models. And I think it's going to pave the way for a lot of super interesting structure in the near future. Yeah, and that's a great point. Go ahead, Jeremiah. That's a great point, Rand, around the transparency for governance. So, John, you posed the question, does this make things faster or slower? And right now, most DAOs are actually pretty slow because they're set up as a flat organization. So as a response to that, they're actually shifting to become representative democracies. Does that sound familiar? Where you can appoint uh, a delegates and you use tokens to vote for them and they have a decision power, almost like a committee and they can function. And so we've seen, actually there are sometimes are hierarchies, except the person at the top is voted by those that have the tokens. In some cases, the people at the top had the most tokens, but that's a whole nother topic. So we're seeing a wide uh, variety of governance structures. 
You know, Ren, I was talking with uh, Matt, the, Matt G, the founder of Unstoppable, and I was telling him about, about the domain name system. And one little trivia note that many people don't know about is that the US government, because the internet was started by the US, the Department of Commerce kept that on tight leash because the International Telecommunications Union wanted to get their hands on it because of CCTLDs and other things. So at that time, because the innovation yet wasn't yet baked out, it was organically growing the governance the rules of the road, keeping it very stable versus meddling with it. So there's certain technologies that require, Jeremiah, that let's keep an eye on as a community, let's not formalize anything like the government did with the domain name system, let's keep it tight and then finally released it, I think multiple years after, 2004, I think it went over to the, to the ITU. But this is a big point. I mean, if you, if you get too structured, organic innovation can't go. What's you guys' reaction to that? So I think, you know, to take a, a stab at it, um, we have, as a business, you know, thinking of unstoppable domains, a strong incentive to innovate. Uh, and this is what is going to be determining long-term value growth for uh, the organization, for uh, partners, for users, for customers. So, you know, that degree of formalization actually gives us um, a sense of purpose and um, a sense of action. And if you compare that to DAOs, for instance, you can see how some of the upsides and downsides can pan out either way. It's not to say that there is a perfect solution. I think one of the advantages of the uh, DAO is that you can let more people contribute. Uh, you can probably remove bias quite effectively, and you can have a high level of participation and involvement in decisions and own the upside in many ways. Um, you know, as a company, it's a slightly different setup. We have the opportunity to coordinate a very uh, diverse and part-time workforce in a very, uh, you know, different way. Um, and we do not have to deal with the inefficiencies that might be inherent to some form of extreme decentralization. So there, there is a balance from an organizational structure uh, that comes uh, either side. Awesome. Jeremy, I want to get your thoughts on, on, on a trend that you've been involved in, we've both been involved in, and you're seeing it now with the kind of social media world, the world of the role of an influencer. It's kind of moved from what was open source, an influencer was a connect to someone who shared, created content, um, enabled things, to much more of a vanity, you get the photo on Instagram and having a large audience. Um, so is there a new influencer model with Web3, or is it is it the, I control the audience, I'm making money that way, is there a shift in the influencer role or, or ideas that you see that should be in place for what is the role of an influencer? Because as Web3 comes, you're going to see that role become instrumental. We've seen it in open source projects, influences, you know, the people who write code or ship code. So what's your take on that? Because this has been a conversation people have been having the word influencer and, and redefining it and reframing it. Sure, the influence model really hasn't changed that much, but the way that they're behaving has when it comes to Web3. In, in this market, I mean, there's a couple of things. Uh, some of the influencers are investors. And so when you see their name on a project or a new startup, that's an indicator that there's a higher level of success. You might want to pay more attention to it or not. Uh, secondly, influencers themselves are launching their own NFT projects. Uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, a number of celebrities, Paris Hilton is involved, and they are also doing theirs as well. Steve Aoki, a uh, famous DJ, launched his as well. So they're going head first and participating and building in this model, and their communities are coming around them, and they're building economies. Now, the difference is... It's not I speak as an influencer to the fans. The difference is that the fans are now part of the community and they hold, they literally hold and own some of the economic value, whether it's tokens or the NFTs. So it's a collaborative uh, economy, if you will, where they're all benefiting together. And that's a, that's a big difference as well. And you're seeing Lastly, there's... There's one little tactic we're seeing where marketers are airdropping NFTs, branded NFTs to influencers' wallets so you can see it in there. So there's new tactics that are forming as well. That's Back super, to you. super exciting. Ren, what's your reaction to that? Because he just hit on a whole new way of, of how engagement's happening, how people are closed looping their, their uh, votes, their, their votes of confidence or votes with their wallet um, and to brands which are artists, now influencers. I mean, this is a whole game changing instrumentation level. I think that what we are seeing right now is super reinvigorating as a marketeer who's been around for a few years, basically. Um, I think that the shift in the way brands are going to communicate and engage with their audiences is profound. It's probably as revolutionary and even more revolutionary than the movement for uh, brands in getting into digital. And you have that you know, sentiment of a gold rush right now with a lot of brands that are trying to understand NFTs and, and how to actually engage with those communities and those audiences. Uh, there are many levels in which 
brands and influencers are going to engage. There are many influencers that actually advance the message and, and the mission because the explosion of content on Web3 has been crazy. Part of that is due to the network effect nature of, of crypto because as Jeremiah mentioned, people are incentivized to promote projects. Holders of an NFT are also incentivized um, to promote it. So you end up with a flywheel, which is pretty unique of people that are hyping their project and that uh, are educating other people about it and commenting on the ecosystem. Uh, with the IP rights being given to NFT holders, you're going to see people promote brands instead of the brands actually having to. And so the notion of brands engaging and delivering you know, elements of the value uh, to their fans is something that's um, super attractive, yeah. extremely interesting. And I think, again, we have hardly scratched the surface of all that is possible in that particular space. It's interesting, you guys are bringing some great insight here. Jeremiah, the old days, the word authentic was a kind of a cliche and brands like tried to be authentic and they didn't really know what to do. They called it organic, right? Mm -hmm. um, and now you have the trust concept with or authenticity in an environment like Web3 where you can actually measure it and monetize it and capture it if you're actually authentic and trustworthy. That's right, and because it's on blockchain, you can see how somebody's behaved with their economic behavior in the past. Of course, big corporations aren't going to have that type of trail on blockchain just yet, but individuals and executives who participate in this market uh, might be. And, and we'll also see new types of affinity. Do executives, do they participate in these NFT communities? Do they purchase them? We're seeing numerous brands like Adidas acquire uh, you know, different NFT projects to participate. And of course, uh, the big brands are, are grabbing their domains. Of course, uh, you could talk to ran about that because owning your own name is a part of this trust and being found. That's awesome. Great insight guys, closing comments, takeaways for the audience here. Each of you take a minute to uh, give, share your thoughts on what you think is happening now, where it goes. All right, where's it going to go? Jeremy, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, I think the vision of Web3 where full decentralization happens, uh, where the power is completely shifted to the edges, I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> I think we will reach Web 2.5. And I've been through so many tech trends where we said that the power is going to shift completely to the end. It, it just doesn't. Uh, and there's two reasons. One is the venture capital are the ones who tend to own the pro programs in the first place. And secondly, the, the startups themselves end up becoming the one percenters. We see Airbnb and Uber are one percenters now. So that trend happens over and over and over. Now, with that said, the world will be in a better place. We will have more transparency. We will see economic um, um, power shifted to the people, the participants. And so they will have more control over the internet that they are building. Awesome, Ren, final, final comments. I'm fully um, aligned with Jeremiah on the notions of control being returned to users, the notion of ownership and the notion of redistribution of the economic value that is created across all the different chains uh, uh, that we are going to see and, and all those ecosystems. I believe that we are going to witness two parallel movements of expansion. One that is going to be very lateral. When you think of crypto and Web3, essentially you think of a few hundred tribes. Uh, and I think that more projects are going to appear, more uh, coalitions of individuals and entities and DAOs are going to exist around those projects. So you're going to see you know, an increase in the uh, number of tribes that one might join. And I also think that we're going to progress rapidly from the low hundred millions of crypto and NFT holders uh, into the billions, basically. Uh, and that's going to be extremely interesting. I think that the next waves of crypto users, NFT fans are going to look very different from the early adopters that we had witnessed in the very early days. So it's not going to be your traditional model of technology uh, adoption curves. I think the demographics are going to shift and the motivations are going to be different as well, which is going to be a wonderful time to educate and engage with new community members. All right, Ren, Jeremy, thank you both for that great insight, great segment. Uh, breaking down Web 3 or Web 2.5 as Jeremiah says, but we're in a better place. This is a segment with the influencers as part of theCUBE's and the Unstoppable Domain Showcase. I'm John Furrier, your host, thanks for watching.